are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Welcome to the Caregiver Reality Show, hosted by gerontologist and family caregiver expert, David Levy, speaking on a topic that is not only a national problem, but an international one, and represents one of the biggest dilemmas facing us today, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. With no cure in sight and hundreds more being diagnosed weekly, Alzheimer's is more feared than cancer or heart disease. Join us as David Levy breaks it down and educates, informs, and explains useful caregiver strategies and techniques that 25 years of non-clinical family caregiving have taught him. You can listen or call in and be part of the show, 888-565-1470 to ask your questions. And now, here's David Levy. Good evening, Boca Raton, America and the world. This is Caregiver Reality, and I'm your host, David Levy, gerontologist, for another session of the Caregiver Reality Show. You can catch us on caregiverreality.com. Click on Live Show. You can also catch us on the Internet if you want to just listen on iheart.com, just like it sounds, I-H-E-A-R-T.com. Click on Florida and just scroll down to WNN. And obviously, you're probably listening to us right now, hopefully, on WWNN, 1470 AM. And if anyone has a question, you can reach us here at 886-565-1470. And so I have a special guest tonight. But before I do, I have just a little bit of things that I, I need to clean up. All right. Yesterday, I had the great opportunity to do a presentation uh, for the new Caribbean coalition that's starting to educate caregivers that are from the Caribbean, both here in South Florida and in the Caribbean itself. I had lunch with the Consul General of Santa Lucia and um, some really brilliant people. And it was a, a great opportunity, but I must give a great shout out to Janice John, who was the coordinator of the event and who introduced me to salt codfish and banana m muffins. I mean, excuse me, coconut muffins that were just the best. The food was just terrific. The audience was grateful. Um, I don't normally go in with 60 uh, business cards, but I did, and every one of them left. All right, They all wanted to know how could they listen to the show, how could they find out more advice, and um, so it was, a, it was very successful. The other thing is I had a meeting with my producer on Friday and I found out a very interesting statistic that almost 80% of our audience are men. It doesn't surprise me, although most people make the assumption that caregivers are women, but they have the ability using as much technology as is available in the background to determine who's on, how long they stay, gender, age, and so we are beginning to pick up uh, a male audience of caregivers, which based on my experience over 25 years doesn't surprise me. Men do not normally reveal themselves as caregivers, whether it's in the workplace or whether it's amongst the social setting until it reaches a certain level. But that doesn't mean that they're not aware that they're doing more and responsible for more and we give them a very easy way to listen kind of anonymously uh, go to the website you can see all the back shows you can see some of the support groups that we do and it allows them to get a little more of an education before necessarily s determining that they're a caregiver and so uh, in, 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 in light of that all right, I went back to take a look is what are the characteristics of men as caregivers, all right? And first of all, almost half the people that are caring for elderly, disabled, or chronically ill are men. And that's significantly higher in spousal care than it has ever been. Men are equally likely to become caregivers, especially those aged 30 to 64. That's not to say that there aren't plenty of male and female spousal caregivers above that age, but it's very interesting in the 30 to 64 year old age, which we've discussed 
in the past, these people are very active in the workplace. They are not retired. They have not uh, quit doing what they're doing. And so the, the act of caregiving and trying to do what they have to do in the workplace can really hurt pr productivity in that workplace and also limit what they are able to do in terms of being able to go out on assignment, to be able to do certain things, trying to schedule around their caregiving situations. So men make up 44% of the caregiving world, but they cope very differently than women. Men are more likely than women to delegate caregiving responsibilities to other family members when they can. Men may not have the same comfort or confidence level as women do, because women have kind of always had the, the traditional role of nurturer and carer, and especially in raising children. But men don't kind of come across with that caregiving gene. That's not to say that they don't care, but it's just not intuitive as compared to women. And they tend to approach caregiving a little differently than women. And they are more likely to try problem solving because they are used to solving problems without necessarily going ahead and asking how to do it. It's similar to uh, a wife complaining that the husband just went past the gas station and he didn't have his GPS on, and so he's going to figure out how to get there, but he's not going to ask. Or on Hanukkah or Christmas, putting together the erector set and not bothering to uh, open up the instructions because they'll just figure it out. Unfortunately, caregiving isn't just the I'll figure it out, and the planning skills that they have are more oriented to the things that they have done in their lives and in their work and not necessarily related to care. Men lag behind women in their willingness to take the initiative to participate in support groups, even though these support groups for caregivers are involved in most parts of the country. Now, over the years, I have watched my caregiving groups go from a majority of them being women to having uh, almost a 40 to 50 percent equal between men and women. I think that once men are comfortable that this isn't just for women but that it recognizes them as caregivers and they can come into it at their own speed especially when they've been introduced by word of mouth from another male caregiver. Um, it seems to make the job a little bit easier. Men react differently to depression in long-term family caregiving. They are less likely than women to admit that they feel depressed, talk with their doctors, or take antidepressants. As a result, men are more likely to neglect themselves, become drinkers, ignore their diets, not get good sleep, and all of those are not good habits for being a caregiver. And men are more likely to want to manage finances than women. So those are just some of the distinctions between men and women. And tonight, I have a unique opportunity, and I asked one of my male caregivers in one of my big support groups whether or not he would be willing to come on, since Paul is not here tonight, to discuss his aspect of caregiving. And um, his name is Herb. And uh, good evening, Herb. Thank you very much for being here. Good evening, David. Thank right. you. And uh, you and I have known each other for a while now, and I thought that your story is pretty indicative of a lot of circumstances, even though as it evolved, you didn't necessarily know what was coming. And so right. I'm going to ask you, without getting into the history of the war, all right, why don't you pick up when you first began to notice that uh, your wife something was wrong yeah actually it wasn't me it was uh, my son uh, and the reason I, I think it wasn't me is because dementia or Alzheimer's disease is very gradual and I'm with her every day and so you didn't see the little nuances of problems as they were developing whereas my son uh, would see her maybe once a month or once every two months and uh, uh, one day he uh, he said to me dad you got a problem uh, mom is not uh, uh, she's not remembering certain things and I said now oh, it's just a normal process of aging mm -hmm. uh, we continued along did those he, lines. Did, did he try and convince you that you were not right about this is just the normal process of aging? Did he try and he did. In, invoke his doctor? Yeah, well, he is a doctor. <laughs> he, he did, and uh, 
uh, finally we ended up taking her to a facility for testing mm -hmm. and they said that to me that she was in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's uh, which wasn't too troublesome at that point because we just I just did the cooking or I did the driving and, and the shopping and I did it with her uh, it, it wasn't too much of a burden um, were you still active at that time in the workplace? I was. Okay. And, but she wasn't, she was able to pretty much stay with her friends and go out for lunch or meet with them socially until uh, we had a rude awakening one day when we were traveling cross country by car. And uh, she had gone in to um, take a shower and came out, she was fully dressed, and looked me right in the eye and asked me who I was. Meaning who you were. Who, meaning who I was. Okay. Big shock. Yes. Uh, so much so that I uh, contacted my son, who then spoke to his uh, neurologist, mm -hmm. and he suggested I do one of two things, either continue with the trip or come home. And, and what did you elect to we do? We elected to continue because we were going to a wedding out in San Diego. Uh, it was a, it was a difficult trip from that point on because she was repetitive in requests that I just couldn't fulfill. One being that she wanted to call her mother, and uh, her mother at that point had been deceased for probably around ten, ten, twelve years. Mm -hmm. And each time she uh, mentioned that, I would basically put her off and say, "When we get back to a hotel tonight, that's when we'll call your mom." We so don't want to. So even in the early stages like that, you mm -hmm. weren't arguing with her. Oh no, no, no! I was pretty good, <laughs> and right. she was somewhat receptive, but uh, still the, the issues kept coming up, right. and um, she couldn't order off of a menu any longer at that point either, and so I would take the menu, and I knew pretty much uh, what she would eat, so I would just go ahead and do that. Right. When you uh, got to San Diego to uh, the wedding, yes. What was her behavior, and did other people? comment and notice that your wife was yeah. different than maybe the last time they saw her yeah we we were rather fortunate in that we were with friends some friends that we had known for many years and uh, uh, I specifically told them of our incident mm -hmm. and uh, I, at that point I went through a transition too because uh, I now began to realize that we had a problem and whereas I would excuse things in the past now I was more open about discussing them and um, the friends kind of accepted it and didn't comment one way or the other, but uh, they, they just noticed that there was a ter deterioration. So we got did, home. Did, all right, so you drove back yeah, from got California, home. and as you drove back, recognizing that things had dramatically changed from that day in the hotel um, where she came out and asked you who you were. Yes, what were you thinking on that way back? Because that was a lot of drive time and an, and an opportunity to think. Did you think that at that moment or somewhere along the way that your life was now changing? Or did you I just... Don't, you know, I don't really remember too much about it, David. I, I was very concerned that... I, I, actually, I was anxious to get back home where we had the comfort level of the house. And, um, and also I was anxious to talk further with... Uh, uh, both my son and a neurologist and try mm -hmm. to find out more and what drugs were available to try to ward off the further deterioration subsequently I found out that drugs were not terribly terribly effective mm -hmm. and um, when we got home it just we fell into a routine at that point and um, and you kind of ran interference. Yeah, I did. Uh, but, but I also got her enrolled into a uh, into a day program. And uh, I was told that I probably needed to join a caregiver support group, okay. which I did do. All right. Did you recognize at that point that you had kind of transitioned a little from husband to caregiver, oh. whatever you thought the definition of caregiver was? Absolutely. Although I didn't really know. I was, I was really in the infancy see the the whole process mm -hmm. uh, what I did do though when I went to the support group is I found out that there were others who had it much worse than I mm -hmm. I also found out there were others who weren't quite up to the stage that we were at and there was a give-and-take and it was very helpful but we talked about the simplicity of things as they evolved at that point 
and not too much about what the disease was and where it was going to go finally. Right. The oh. things that we discussed, for example, was misplacing a, a telephone or a, or a remote control for a TV right. set. Right, finding the, something in the freezer that yeah, you didn't we, expect to be know, there. And how do you deal with that kind of thing? And, mm-hmm. and so I thought that was... That was being a caregiver. Little did I know. <laughs> right. All right. And and in in your support group, when you first got started, and you listened to others, because it's my, been my experience doing this for 25 years. Um, even if there's a delay in the diagnosis, most people come into a support group kind of indicating after they listen that their loved one is a little more high functioning than the others until they recognize after a period of time exactly that that, that dementia is a great levelizer oh ex- exactly and that that was pretty much where we're at i think the uh, uh the big change occurred when one day i got a phone call uh from the daycare center telling me that my wife was no longer appropriate for the group and that was a major uh, blow. I, I, I you, tried to define... In other words, even though she was in or, or going to a day program that was for dementia, ostensibly of the yes. Alzheimer's type, they had determined that she was no longer appropriate? Yeah. And, what w- and was that because of her behavior or their expectations of what they could do with her no longer allowed them to... Probably their expectations, because she has always been docile, uh, and, and she was never aggressive in anything that she did. Uh, uh, she had problems with, uh, if, is, when we would come out of the facility uh, and I'd pick her up, I'd ask her if she had a snack or something like that, and she said no, and I was quite aware that she had been given something during the session. Um, she was... She was also using, at that point, we were starting to use Depends. Uh, All right, which are it was the incontinence problem. diapers for anybody yeah. that is unaware. And by the way, um, right now, I'm not going uh, to our 15-minute break so that we can continue on. But if anybody out there wants to ask a question, 888-565-1470. And if you don't get an opportunity to call, but you'd like to ask Herb or myself a question, you can go to caregiverreality.com, post a message to us, and we'll be very happy um, to respond back and give you the insight that both of us as caregivers and me as 25 years of doing this and dealing almost exclusively with dementia um, have to tell you. So let's pick up where you were. Yes. Well, at that point now, we were home together. Okay. And after a, um, several incidences where uh, uh, we had problems with toileting and, and sleeping and, and that type of thing. Was I she a wanderer in the house? Not at that point. Or in the house she was, but not quite outside yet. And uh, what I did is I finally ended up bringing someone into the house to help me during the daytime. Mm-hmm. But the daytime started at, at 8 o'clock and ended at 5. So... From five so basically o'clock you on, had a caregiver for nine hours a nine day. Nine hours a day. And uh, getting her to bed and, and um, uh, making certain that she had her dinner and, and I did the wash and, and everything else. So it became a, a full-time event even though I had help for the nine hours a day. Right. And you were still trying to keep up your work. Still trying to keep up <clears throat> what I was doing for work. Let me ask you this. Not easy, by the way. I'm, believe me. I understand that completely mm. because, as Poco says, I are they. I, mm. I'm a family caregiver as well, and I know all the juggling that I have to do with my schedule in order to fit things around, you know, what is today's event. Now, my wife doesn't have Alzheimer's, as I told the audience, but her issues are significant enough that being a caregiver for it certainly um, makes it very clear to me that the issues that you're talking about now affect all caregivers and men especially because I want to problem solve too and I'm supposed to know it all but when uh, or or a lot but when it's your own you're very emotionally involved and it really changes the perspective and the objectivity that you can give we're all great at giving advice to others 
Oh, I got a lot of advice, Dave. Yeah, all right. Uh, I think the other thing that uh, was a major change, too, was that I had this woman who happened to be very, very good at what she did. Uh, You're talking about the aide that the you hired. The aide that I hired for that. But she was not on on weekends, uh-huh. and so that fell on my plate. Uh, and I began to realize that this is getting more and more difficult each time. Um, I'm just going to take you through the the next steps. If no, I no, can. that's Please. fine. I want you to tell it yeah. your way. The uh, finally, what happened was uh, two 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 major things started to occur. One is uh, that was rather significant is that this woman who was helping me called me on a Thursday f a Thursday morning rather, mm-hmm. and announced that she couldn't make it that day. And I said, okay, no problem. When I finally spoke to her. That evening, she told me she had taken another job. Right. And Did you reason, know why? Yes, was was uh, it the difficulty with your wife? No, or not at all. Prior no. commitments that came to pass, or what? she earned more money. Ah, significantly more money uh-huh. because she had been with a family prior to that, and uh, they were being she was being paid through a corporate payroll, ah, and I see. and it was a relative of the woman who she had taken care of previously. So that was kind of a big shock. Mm-hmm. And uh, the next uh, thing that I think that was significant was... Did you have long-term care insurance? We do. We still do. Okay. <laughs> and hopefully we do for as long as we need it. Um, and, I, and I would remind our audience out there, if you'd like to ask a question of Herbra myself, 888-565-1470. And uh, you're listening to the story told by... A real live spouse caregiver who discovered on a trip to California the reality that his wife was coming down with some form of dementia and how it has unfolded since then yes. so uh, the woman that you had working for you all of a sudden decided that there were greener pastures which will happen did uh, and uh, <laughs> so what did you do well I took over the role of 24 hour seven day a week care uh, the big change that happened beyond that was that uh, uh, one day I was looking for my wife, and she had left the house, oh. unbeknownst to me. And um, is that the first time that she had done it that? Was the first, actually, it was the second time. But it was this was the first time she was more cognizant of what was going on, and I uh, she she came back and I, and I asked her where she went, and she really didn't know, and okay. said, "Well, you can't do that again." And but this time uh, she left the house, and uh, it was night. I didn't realize it because I was in the garage at the time, and. Uh, um, when I went to look for her uh, throughout the house, I couldn't find her. Mm-hmm. And then I started to look up the street, down the street, and finally I, I got into the car and I was backing out of the garage when a neighbor came over and asked me if my wife's name was Linda. And I, of course, told him, of course, yes. She had walked over to his house. And then didn't know how to come home. Didn't know how to come home and didn't realize even where she was at. And it was about that point in time I thought that I really need to get her into a facility where they can care for her a lot better than I can. Uh, yeah, but that that created a certain because I know you, yes. and that we we as both uh, caregiver and facilitator, but also as friends, uh, I was there as you began to wrestle with that decision, and and we discussed often your independence and quality of life as well as your wife's independence and quality of life and whether or not it might be a little easier to have somebody else do the heavy lifting as it were and you become a great advocate on her behalf and what i did is i uh, i did make an application to what i thought was the the best facility around but it was also very close to my house it's within a half a mile and um, I did get a phone call inviting me to bring her in. And uh, I thought about it with a tremendous amount of trepidation. trepidation. And about an hour later, I called them back and I said, I'm sorry, but I can't do it. Okay. It was about four weeks later, I got a second phone call. And they told me that I can, and this was on a Friday, and I could bring her in on a Monday. And I said, oh, good. Uh, you know, I think that now is the right time. And. So that was uh, but, a long weekend. That it? was a long weekend. It was like one month's worth of weekends. And what I did is, uh, by Saturday morning, I called him back and I said, I'm sorry, but I, I really can't do this to my wife. 
um, we uh, let it go for about another four weeks, and I got Did the. Were you worried that it was three strikes and you? No, were be I wasn't out? worried about that, but <laughs> I was. But I was. I meant for, more for you uh, yeah, than I whether know, or not they would say no. No, I was. I, I think what it was is that I was more aware that things were progressing uh, downward continually, right. and so finally on the third call, um, they told me that I could bring her in the next day, and I did that. Uh, Always with, and for the benefit of the audience, and you know it now too, that when you put somebody in a facility, um, you always have the option of taking them out. Yes. So if it was an oops decision or one that you regretted afterwards, you're not sending somebody off to prison. You're simply yeah. placing them in a facility, and um, you can go back with their suitcase on any given day and tell them, you know yeah. what? I mean, you know, recognizing that there's a certain uh, time period that you need to let them know. But a lot of self-examination goes into it, including the fact that uh, uh, obviously driving her there, packing her suitcase, leaving her there, um, you walk away in tears. Uh, we're married over 50 years at that point, and there was a uh, concern that uh, would she be taken care of adequately, and would she be fed, and she's now no longer going to be living and sleeping in her bed, in her house, with and you. with me, and um, even now, uh, she's been in there now about nine months. And they're doing a very fine job of taking care of her. There aren't, there are some problems, but the but facility. You always, but remember, yeah. nobody's going to. They may be doing it magnificently well, yeah. but you, as the spouse, are always going to find things that you think that you could have done better, quicker, yes. easier, and things do slip through the cracks no matter how great a facility is. That's right. I'm very happy with the facility in general, uh, and there are small things that come up, and I try to uh, work around them. And the staff there is very su supportive and very understanding. Um, Would I'm you? over there now about probably between three and five times a week. Okay. In the beginning, you were there seven days a week. I was there seven days a week. And, uh, you in fact, I wanted to move in, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, but they you didn't accept. quite meet they, the they, you know, criteria, no. did you? No, not quite. All right. But um, a lot of folks, when they first place somebody in the facility, don't know how to detach. And so they're there both for their own mm. comfort level as well as beginning to deal with what I call placement guilt. Mm -hmm. Should I have done this? Was it too soon? Could I have kept them home longer? All the things that caregivers go through when they have to make uh, a facility decision. And Very it's difficult. not easy. Very difficult. <coughs> as, you, as you look back now, nine months later, not within the first few weeks, was it the right thing to do? Oh, absolutely. I, uh, I explained this to both my sons, and, and you mentioned already that one of my sons is a physician, so is the second son. Mm -hmm. And um, my older son, uh, although I repeated this to him recently, and he said he doesn't remember saying it, uh, he said uh, he thought that that was probably the right thing to do because otherwise he ran the risk of losing both parents. It is a terribly, terribly burdensome chore and it wears on you. I probably gained 15, 20 pounds. It was your uh, own cooking. Well, it was my own cooking, but it was also a lot of alone time, mm -hmm. starting at about 8.30 at night, watching television and snacking and things like that. So that was not the fun part of it all. Right. And did you find a decline in your health that uh, was demonstrable by your doctor? Or No, my younger I mean, son you, is... Did, is your, <laughs> did your blood pressure go up? Did you find that at times you had palpitations or uh, things like that? No, unfortunately, my younger son happens to be a cardiologist, and oh, he, wasn't, all right, so. he wasn't happy with the uh, the weight gain at all. Oh, so he took uh, it all to heart. Yeah, right? he, he certainly <laughs> did. He didn't gain any weight, by the way. <laughs> all right, well, you know, uh, but it's good to know that we have family that yep. support us because it sounded like from early on uh, he, yeah. when he recognized it said dad you're going to have to do something things yeah. are changing we are at our station break time and mm -hmm. so we're going to let uh, the station come on and identify themselves you're listening to the caregiver reality show WWNN 1470 AM if you'd like to ask a question 888-565-1470 or tune in to caregiverreality.com, click on live show, and here we are in living color.
And it'll be posted tomorrow for those of you that may be listening on the radio and just can't wait to see it again. All right, we'll go to that break now. Times are tough, and right now those in the commercial world know that being heard via advertisements is the name of the game. AmpSquare.tv understands how important advertisement is and is proud to express that it's truly the only plugged-in internet television production company on the market. Amp2.tv live streams all their shows across all the major selling markets in the U.S. and abroad. Call them at 866-224-5422. The AmpSquare.tv library allows productions to be seen over and over again, making commercial platforms more usable. Call 866-224-5422. Toll free 866-224-5422. Amp2.tv, the first and only internet television network that's truly plugged in. 866-224-5422. That's A-M-P, the number two, dot TV. Hello, are you a family caregiver? Are you taking care of a spouse, parent, or loved one who can no longer care for themselves? Are you dealing with Alzheimer's disease and don't know what to do? Are you stressed, burned out, frustrated, and don't know where to turn? Have you realized that your doctor, lawyer, and mental health professionals don't have real practical answers? You need a non-clinical family caregiver expert that the professionals turn to. You need David Levy. He is a family caregiver expert with 25 years of active experience with thousands of family caregivers. He can help you provide a better quality of life for you and your loved one. Contact David Levy at dlevy at caregiveredorg. That's dlevy at caregiveredorg. Or call 561 561- 482-0086. And let's get your mental road to healing started. And we're back right here in Boca Raton. It's a lovely evening. Last week we had horrendous rain, so if some of you had some connectivity issues, it was because of the weather. But uh, today was a beautiful day, and uh, it's a lovely evening. And I'm here with Herb, who is a spousal caregiver who discovered on a trip to go see friends and family for a wedding that his wife um, had a cognitive problem. And his son, who was a doctor, recognized it and said, Dad, we have a problem. And um, he went and kept her at home with both his ability and aid. And then after the aid left, uh, Herb felt that he could handle the situation on his own. But unfortunately, the stress and the inability to be in all places at all times that was soon to culminate with his wife wandering away one night without him being aware of it is that he went through the decision-making process that was very difficult but ultimately he recognized that the right thing to do was to place his loved one in a facility and he would become a great caregiver advocate which knowing him personally he has become just that and he has a lot of insight to the process and that was one of the reasons why I asked him to be here and so um, without any further ado Herb after you placed your wife and a few months went by you know you mentioned earlier that you were taking out your loneliness and other things in food did anything come about to change any of that yes it did I, when I had the woman come into the house um, to support what I was doing during the daylight hours, she also mentioned to me that she had a friend that she would like to introduce me to when I was ready. And in a kind of a macho way, I responded, well, I'm ready, yeah. not thinking of what it could lead to or the implications and uh, um, eventually I, I uh, without going through a lot of the detail but no, eventually no. met the uh, a woman and um, we have values that are very similar uh, she's very understanding she knows and has met my wife she joins me when I go over there to feed her uh, which I mentioned I do about four or five times a week. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, she goes over there sometimes on her own and takes uh, help, helps Linda. Um, 
we so some of the loneliness and some of the angst that when your wife began to succumb to dementia and could no longer communicate and do other things with you go out for dinner go to the movies because either she couldn't enjoy it or it just wasn't a comfortable situation for you part of your life became hollow oh absolutely uh, because you didn't have a companion somebody to share things with and even to go out and have a pizza Oh, it was it was horrible. Uh, uh, in fact, I'll never forget when we went to uh, uh, a restaurant. Feminist yeah. way, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said she could speak for herself. Oh, and, meaning your uh, wife in the meaning restaurant. Meaning my wife in the restaurant, okay. and uh, it, it was. Uh, it was uncomfortable more so for her than it was for, for the waitress than it was for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that point, I carried a card uh, with me indicating that my wife had dementia and uh, please understand that she could not do certain things on her own. And when I gave her the card, the waitress was extremely apologetic and right. uh, also embarrassed by the whole thing. And uh, we kind of let it go with that. I still tipped her. Okay. <laughs> so, All right. So you're still good to go back. It's still good to go back to the same restaurant. Okay. And when you finally allowed yourself to meet this woman. Yes. Okay. And begin to kind of fill a little bit of that hole. Did you find... Oh, first, before I go there. <clears throat> before you finally placed your wife in a facility, did you find that the folks that you socialized with had started to step back and that others because they didn't know how to deal with you with a wife that had dementia? Uh, They stepped back, not because they didn't know how to deal with me, but they didn't know how to deal with Linda. I think that uh, a couple of things entered into it. One is they didn't know how to speak to her, and she didn't respond. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, now she really doesn't talk. Uh, But I, I think they felt uncomfortable uh, whether it be the social setting in a restaurant or going to a, uh, a music performance or mm-hmm. whatever. And so they began to drift away. Instead of us seeing them socially, we were, uh, I'll use the word ostracized, but we were basically uh, right. left to our own, own, our own. Now, w- I, I meant to ask you a question. When your wife was told that she was no longer appropriate for daycare, yes, sir. did you remain in the support group? No. I did not. Um, I I decided if she wasn't appropriate, I would drop out also. <clears throat> and um, uh, but I ended up with David Levy. <laughs> I know him well. <laughs> yes, and I started to go to that support group. But at that point, I had take help or help with right. her during the daytime. And I must say that over the last year or so that you that I've known you and you've been part of the support group. Um, you have really matured in terms of recognizing your role as caregiver and being objective with the other people in the support group because we do have a large support group yes and we get new people in and out all the time but I think that your awareness and your perspective um, kind of now as a more mature caregiver um, has helped to enhance the group and I hope you still continue to find benefit from it (coughs) well where I was, <coughs> excuse me. Where I was, I was receiving a lot of information, and it was making me more comfortable in my role. I think that now I'm able to provide information and guidance, helping others become more comfortable in their role. Right. So it's the new people coming in, learning from the older people who have been right. there, done that. It's like the tribe. You yeah. learn from the tribal elders. Yeah. There's, there's not a lot of good literature out there that. T- there's, there are, there's a lot of literature that tells you the progression of the disease, mm-hmm. and I did read a lot of it. The problem is that unless you experience it, it doesn't really sink in. Right. And so there's no way to kind of prepare yourself no. for Alzheimer's. And, and you know, one of the other things, w- without casting any aspersions at anybody, most people that write books about caregiving are typically how I took care of my loved one. Yes. And they're usually written in hindsight, and the perspective of how tough it was 
even in hindsight, begin, you know, the, the edge goes off of some of the difficulty and we become a little more enamored of, of ourselves. So, yes. And Herb, you know the, the great adage. If you've seen one case of Alzheimer's, you've seen, seen one. one. So reading a book on how somebody dealt with their loved one in their particular circumstances does not necessarily transpose itself. Yes. And so I think that the, um, the support group is really the Rosetta Stone between, assuming that it's well facilitated uh, and not a pity party. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the first support groups I went to were um, not handled very well because the facilitators were really not terribly... They, they were educated, but they had not gone through the experience of being caregivers. And I think that that was a major, um, had a major effect on me as well. Um, when I joined your group, in fact, I joined several of your groups, so we meet right. a couple of times a week. Um, I found that there was greater insight, both from a technical point of view, as to the deterioration of the, of the brain and the drugs that are out there and how they impact or don't impact on the future of the individual and that too has been very um, very helpful to me well i'm glad that both the group and myself individually mm -hmm. because you and i have gotten close um have been a benefit that's what a support group is all about and it's gaining that perspective getting comfortable to the degree that one can but it's giving back and there's nothing that's more rewarding i feel than being in a position to give back to somebody who was first walking in the in the sneakers that you wore, yeah. even though every case is individual, it's nice to hear from other human beings how things went, what you did, advice, support, and the group that you belong to is a very cohesive one, and it tends to be a yeah. large family. And, uh, I, I like that. I think. There's a couple other aspects of this which I, I'm going to bring up here. One is uh, uh, my wife has, has many women, has a wardrobe and, and shoes, and uh, obviously her wardrobe in the facility is quite different than if we were going out to a, to a, a wedding or, right. or any kind of a social event. Uh, I have not yet been able to pack up things and give them away. Oh. They still continue to hang in the closet. That's okay. Uh, as long as it doesn't bother you. No. Was, All right. Uh, then you keep them there. Yeah, but it's very difficult because uh, as you start Well, it's to a constant it's, reminder. But then again, it's the house you lived in. It's the setting that yes. you were in. So, And the fact that you're not far away from, from where the facility is and you're there on the regular basis that you are... So it's not going to be an item where throwing out some dresses are going to make a difference yeah. in not remembering or taking away um, the hurt that you've learned how to live with and now the guilt that you have learned how to yes. you know, subordinate and become somebody that recognizes that it was the right thing to do. I see by the clock on the wall since I had promised you that you could you could leave by quarter of seven so that you could keep a dinner date. Yes, I'm going to do you. that. I want to thank you so very much for being here. You added a different dimension every time I have a caregiver on and they tell their story. Um, it's illuminating and it's revealing and it's educational. And I want to thank you very much. And I will see you on Wednesday at our support group. Yes, you will. Okay. Thank you so very much, So enjoy your dinner. Thank you. And um, say hello to your uh, lovely companion. I will. Thank you very much, David. Very good. Thank you. And uh, we'll take a quick break. And when I come back, we're going to talk about Dr. David Hilfiker, who last week revealed the fact that after running a blog for the last year and a half that says, I have Alzheimer's, he realized that he doesn't. Or at least he has not been diagnosed with it, but has all the symptoms of cognitive impairment, and nobody can figure out why. I tried to reach him today, but he's on a train to West Virginia, but I will be talking with him, and we're going to get him back on real soon. So let's go to that break. Hello. Are you a family caregiver? Are you taking care of a spouse, parent, or loved one who can no longer care for themselves? Are you dealing with Alzheimer's disease and don't know what to do? Are you stressed, burned out, frustrated, and don't know where to turn? Have you realized that your doctor, lawyer, and mental health professionals 
don't have real practical answers. You need a non-clinical family caregiver expert that the professionals turn to. You need David Levy. He is a family caregiver expert with 25 years of active experience with thousands of family caregivers. He can help you provide a better quality of life for you and your loved one. Contact David Levy at dlevy at caregivered.org. That's dlevy at caregivered.org. Or call 561-482-0086. And let's get your mental road to healing started. Times are tough, and right now those in the commercial world know that being heard via advertisements is the name of the game. AmpSquare.tv understands how important advertisement is and is proud to express that it's truly the only plugged-in internet television production company on the market. Amp2.tv live streams all their shows across all the major selling markets in the U.S. and abroad. Call them at 866 224 54 the AmpSquare.tv library allows productions to be seen over and over again, making commercial platforms more usable. Call 866-224-5422. Toll free 866-224-5422. Amp2.tv, the first and only internet television network that's truly plugged in. 866-224-5422. That's A-M-P, the number two, dot TV. Well, we're back, and uh, you're listening to the Caregiver Reality Show. I'm your host, David Levy, gerontologist and family caregiver myself. We just heard from Herb, who gave it and told it just like it was. He went through all of the issues that family caregivers go through, and from a men's perspective or a man's perspective, he had as much difficulty as anybody does, but boy, he told it like it is. And his companion, who I know, is a lovely, lovely lady. And uh, one of these days, uh, in the not-too-distant future, I'm going to have her on. And you can hear the perspective coming from the, not the other woman, but the other person. Because she is such a wonderful person. And she takes as much care and is as involved with Herb in, in helping to take care of his wife. And so... He was a classic person that went through what we call an emotional divorce, not for any other reason than he had a lot of hollowness in his life, and he found somebody that was willing to share it, but not be so possessive that she tried to intrude upon his relationship with his wife or the experience of what's going on inside of the facility that his wife is at. Anyway, last week we found out Dr. David Hilfiker, who we've been following in the blog, discovered that he didn't have Alzheimer's, or at least all the testing that the National Institute of Health did, did not reveal anything that resembled uh, Alzheimer's or any other aspect of dementia or brain deterioration. But yet, all of his symptoms still remain. And so, not only has his been an interesting passage, but he is also a very interesting medical patient. Why does he have all of this mild cognitive impairment and at times really looking like Alzheimer's and discovers on the proper testing both cognitively, psychometrically, brain scans, is they can't find anything. But yet, he's, dis he's still living with the symptoms. So, November 3rd, he posted, um, no, excuse me, I'm going to go to the one that he posted yesterday because it's really an interesting, interesting story. And what he says is, and this was from November 11th, which was last Monday. He's traveling. I tried to reach him today. He's on a train to West Virginia to go visit family now that he has discovered that he doesn't have what he thought he had, and I wonder if he's going to change the name of the blog to, I thought I had Alzheimer's, but nobody can confirm it for me. And so he says, I'm on Antrax somewhere in West Virginia. I'm learning about uncertainty. I no longer have a reasonable medical explanation for my own experience. 
An extensive battery of medical tests gives no physical evidence of brain dysfunction. Laboratory results for many of the usual and unusual causes of cognitive impairment have been normal several times over. Two different MRIs of my brain have negative for brain tumors, stroke, or hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is fluid pressure on the brain, and folks that have Alzheimer's have what's called normal pressure hydrocephalus. He does not have that. Two PET scans, which are positron emission tomography, which is some of the latest form of scan, gave no evidence of Alzheimer's disease or even dementia. And most disturbing to me, recent neuropsychological testing showed no evidence of any cognitive impairment at all. So intensive medical examination that would be expected to explain my symptoms cannot. There are no more tests to take. I must learn to live with the uncertainty. In the past, I've not liked uncertainty, but this time it hasn't been so bad. Whatever my impairment is, I've learned a lot over the past year about accepting uncertainty, which is a very, very big thing to learn, especially for caregivers. Despite the uncertainty, I'm actually a lot happier than I was two years ago, which is pretty easy to understand. I can only wait and see what develops. Either my symptoms will get better, or they'll stay the same, or they'll get worse. If they get better, I don't think I'll really care much about what caused them. If they stay about the same, I'll probably never find out what's causing them. But I'm in good enough shape right now that life would be fine. If my symptoms get worse, the physicians will eventually find evidence of my impairment, if not a cause, so I just have to wait. I can partially explain my acceptance because, regardless why my brain function is slowed, there's no treatment anyway. So the waiting becomes more of a spiritual discipline, a training period for living in the here and now and accepting the word as it is. I'm learning to trust myself. I'm a child of the Enlightenment, which accepts as definitive truth only things ultimately provable by physical evidence. According to that philosophy, just because I experience something doesn't mean it's real. Now that is really a statement. It could be a mirage, a misunderstanding, a hoax, but I doubt very much that all the testing from the NIH is a hoax, or all sorts of things that would make my own experience unreliable. As a physician, I had too many patients whose story simply didn't match the evidence I had. True, for many of them, their symptoms were psychosomatic or not really real. Very real, but due to emotion and not physical causes. Some of those con contradictions were later resolved by re-examining the labs or the x-ray tests, but some were just as mysterious. Unlike most physicians, I suppose, I feel responsible to believe those mysterious stories, trusting my patient's experience, even if I couldn't explain them yet. Trusting my own experience in the face of contrary evidence, however, is new for me because he's an empirical thinker. He expects to see solid, concrete evidence and draw conclusions from it. And it's taking a little bit of practice to get used to it. I know I'm experiencing cognitive impairment. I trust that it is real despite the evidence. I'm choosing to trust myself more than the evidence. This isn't easy for me. Even writing this, I feel defensive, vaguely guilty. Just for you who worry about me, I don't believe I'm guilty of anything. It just feels that way. But this past year of living with uncertainty about my future has given me some small confidence to trust that I'm okay in the here and now. When I live in the here and now, uncertainty about the future ceases to matter. Now that ending sentence, when I live in the here and now, uncertainty about the future ceases to matter, are guiding lights for caregivers as well. We have to learn to live in the here and now and not project things for what may be. One of the things that we know about Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, that just when we think we understand what's going on, just when we think we've got a pattern worked out and that things have a rhythm and a routine, they go upside down and they change. And that is the uncertainty of dementia. And that can be the same with other chronic illnesses. Yesterday, when I was doing my presentation at the Civic Center for the group uh, from the Caribbean, I made it very clear 
that one of the ways that you take some of the uncertainty out of being a caregiver is you need a plan. And people say, well, how the heck do I plan for caregiving? You don't plan for caregiving in advance. You plan for caregiving once you realize you're there. And you need to understand what are your limitations, not just physically, but what do you have in place? Do I have the documentation? Am I financially able to do things? Do I have the backing of my family? Is there sibling conflict? Do we have a place to give care? Do we need to look? Do we have long-term care insurance? All of these variables have to be laid out so that you know what your limitations are and what you can do when the circumstance changes. One of the most important things, and I've repeated it before and I'll say it again for as long as I'm talking to you, the reason that we plan is because if we understand our options, even if they are lousy options, we know that when we make a choice, it was the best we could do with what we had in front of us at the time we did it so that we can move away from feeling guilty that you couldn't do more. When you have a plan and you know what your limitations are, you know exactly what it is that you're capable of doing, that you're capable of affording, or that you're capable of controlling. And so one of the things that's very important to realize that caregiving, when you just get through the day, when with all of the planning, you just made it work. That's a great day. There is no perfection in caregiving. There are no perfect caregivers. I don't care how you view yourself. Nobody is Mother Teresa and Florence Nightingale where they can just do things and it comes out perfectly. We deal in an imperfect world. We're dealing with a disease that is very, very unpredictable. And just in this past week, and we'll be talking about it, today I read that they've come up with another form of dementia that they never really realized. It's called you, your hippocampus, which is your librarian that takes all the information in and stores it, can get sclerosis, which means hardening of the veins and arteries that are in the hippocampus. That's very different than placking and tangles. If we can approach those that may have hippocampal sclerosis and treat it like we do other hardening of the artery, then maybe, just maybe, for that form of dementia, there might be an aspect of a cure or at least a way to control it from getting any worse. But we also know that in the last two weeks, they've discovered 11 more genes that contribute to dementia as well as MS, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's. So we are on a journey, Boca America and the world, and it will be long and involved. But the more we dig, the more we discover. And the matrix that we look at to make up our minds about what we have to do gets longer, taller, and wider. So don't be discouraged. The reason that you're listening to Caregiver Reality is because I'm doing the homework. I'm here to help you. We have the resources to at least help you understand and how to plan. If you go on the website, and I'm not huckstering, caregiverreality.com, you can buy my non-clinical family caregiving book that won the Florida Council on Aging Award this year. It's called Non-Clinical Caregiving. And go pick up a copy and learn how to plan. And so, Boca. America in the world, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for listening tonight. Remember, this is not my mission. It's my passion. So have a good evening and good night. You have been listening and watching David Levy, gerontologist and non-clinical family caregiving expert. Visit our website at caregiverreality.com and hear and see unscripted family caregiver support groups discussing all of the questions that you have wanted to ask but didn't know where to turn. Tune in again next time for more updates and special guests who bring their caregiving experience to you so that you can deal with your problems and hear how family caregiving is affecting fellow Americans just like you. The opinions is